I want you to know that tonight is one of those nights that uh, whatever you put into this service is probably what you're going to be able to, to take out of it. You're going to have to work with me just a little bit. You know, what, I, what I've found with this whole thing of the judgment seat of Christ is uh, most of us know about that event. And we know that we are going to stand someday soon before our Savior. We understand that it is going to be a time of accounting. And yet, have you found, like I have, that it's just real difficult to keep an eternal perspective about life? You know, Paul was the man. And the reason that he was the man is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. He said, while we look, not at things that are seen, because the things that are seen are, do you know the word? Temporal. He said, the things that are not seen are eternal. And boy, I'm just telling you, I've found that it's just real tough with everything that we can see in life. Sometimes it is hard to get that focus onto that eternal realm. And really what tonight is all about is uh, an attempt to help all of us to, to see into that eternal realm. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not an original uh, thing with, with me. Uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is basically based on a, a book that is becoming popular right now that is called the Bema, which is uh, uh, the Greek word for the judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And before we get started tonight, I would like to ask you to just still your heart with me. Would you bow your head and would you ask God tonight to open your spiritual eyes? Do you remember what the, the scripture says about we Laodiceans? We think that we see and yet we are blind. And what the Lord Jesus Christ says to us is that we need to anoint our eyes with eye salve that we may see. And would you ask God tonight to anoint your eyes that you may be able to see into that eternal realm and that will leave here different people. And oh God, every time that we come into a room like this, we understand how desperate we are for you and for your spirit to move in our hearts and tonight we come before you and we still ourselves we're asking you to do in this service tonight exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think I pray that this will not just be a momentary time for us to see into the eternal realm. I pray that what you do in our midst tonight would be used to change the course and direction of our lives and literally change eternity for us because of what you do in this place. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, was this a day. I mean, this was a day unlike any other day. This was, this was the day. This was the day when Jesus Christ returned. And, and, and really, to, to get the, the, the full scope of it, I, I need to just back you up into my life and what had been going on just, just recently. Wow, things at work had just gotten totally chaotic. There, there was this, this proposal that I had been working on, and, and the, the boss had told me that if we could land th this account, it, it could mean great things for me. And so, man, I had been working really hard. I'd been skipping everything, man. I'd been skipping the kids' games. I'd, I'd been skipping dinner. I'd been skipping church. I'd been skipping everything, trying to just get that thing done. 
And on this particular day, it was the day that the proposal had to be done. I had a two o'clock deadline, so just like most of those other days, I, I got up early and made my way to the office. The sun wasn't even up yet. And as I, I'm pulling into the parking lot, I, I get out of my car and I, 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 could, I could see him. And it was the same way every stinking morning. Joe, you know, I, I can't even think of Joe's last name. Joe the security guard, we'll call him. But, but Joe, he's always at the door and, and he, he just tends to drive me crazy just a little bit because he's one of those, you know, always sunny types, you know. I know more than get out of my car. And, and he's, he's like, good morning, Mr. Matthewson. And, and that's, that's my name, by the way, Daniel James Matthewson. And, and as soon as I'm getting out of my car, he's working me. Hey, good morning, Mr. Matthewson. And he comes over to where I am and he, he's walking me in and he says, it's a great day, isn't it, Mr. Matthewson? The Lord's been real good to you, hasn't he? And let me just remind you, Mr. Matthewson, every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Joe. And I'm walking on into the, into the elevator, and you know, he's still, yeah, well, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, Joe. And, Hit the door, the elevator closed, and I'm like, wow, how do you act like that all the time, you know? So I get up to the, the 28th floor where my office is, and I, I, I walk down the hall, I open the door, and doggone it, she's in there again, the cleaning lady. I, and I told her, now listen, I got a lot of things to be doing, and I want you out of there before I come in to my office, and so... I, I got all this stuff. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying. I got all this stuff on my mind, and I, I, I walk into to the office, and she's polishing the pictures behind my desk, and she's wanting to talk, and I don't have time today to talk with this woman. And I'm trying to send that signal to her, and she's not getting it. And, and she's, good morning, sir. That, that sir thing. She, she's from the Philippines, and so she always works the sir thing with me. Good morning, sir, she says. She says, sir, you have such a, such a wonderful family. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, what, whatever. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm not one to be rude to her. You know, I'm a Christian and all. And, and so I, I'm not one to be rude to this lady, but I don't have time to just be standing around talking to her about all of this stuff and and she finally I think she got the signal and so she walks around my desk and she goes over to the door and she says you're a good man Mr. Matthewson I just want you to know sir that I pray for you every day and I pray for your kids and I'm like oh yeah right now she's going to put me on the guilt trip you know and so she she walks out busy busy morning people started coming in and uh, you know I, what, what can i say there's a, just a lot of I, here's this deadline a lot of the people that i had to see on that morning hadn't done the things that i had asked them to do and so i, I had to get in their face a little bit yeah i, I know i'm a christian but you know what sometimes you just got to do what you got to do and so I, I did have to yell just a little bit didn't feel real good about it but you know we had that deadline coming and man worked like crazy and around noon, I got the thing done, and I felt like, all right, whew, after several months of working my tail off, I'm finally going to be able to, to just relax for a couple of hours. So I, I got my keys, and I, I went down the stairs and went out to my car and, and got in the car and was just beginning to head to, to get a bite to eat, when all of a sudden... It happened. I, I heard that the, the trumpet, and before I, anything could even register in my mind, there I was in heaven. And it, it was just, it was breathtaking. Man, I, I, my mind was just going a thousand miles an hour, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking around trying to take it all in, and here were millions 
written millions and millions of people, and we were we were kind of like in this uh, in this huge foyer, and we were we were making our way through, and I, and I noticed up above there was this massive book, and underneath the book these words that said the Lamb's book of life and as I looked at it I could see millions and millions and even billions of names in, in the book and yet my eyes went to one name Daniel James Matthewson written in the blood of Jesus Christ and as soon as I saw it, my mind went back to that time as a 15-year-old kid when I invited Jesus Christ to come to be the Lord of my life. And it was just, it was just incredible. The, the only way that I, I know to describe it, I mean, and, and the, the feeling that was in the air, I don't know if you've ever been a part of a, a, a ticket tape parade like you, you see in New York City with all of the, the big fanfare and all of the, the cheering and the, the jubilance and the excitement and there was all of that going on and we were, we were making our, our way in and, and we passed through the book of life and we came into this it's just unbelievable area and I, I was just taking it all in and I, I went over and sat down right on a little ledge there of a wall of jasper I'm, I'm just thinking back and thinking through all of what is going on and, and you know I kind of had the feeling I don't know if you've ever felt this you know you're, you're alone and yet you don't feel like you're alone and, and, I, and I, I'm having that, that feeling at that moment and, and I, I said hello is, is somebody here? And a voice said, hello. And, I, and I'm, I'm looking around and and here was this, this being. I said, what, what are you? He said, I, I'm, I'm an angel. And, and he was kind of like a, a, a translucent body of, of light. And I said, Wow, an, an angel. I've never met an angel before. And, and he said, well, I'm, I'm Muriel, and though you've never met an angel, he says, Daniel, I've known you ever since you were born. And I said, you're my guardian angel? He said, well, you know, we don't use that terminology up here, but if you want to... If you want to refer to me as that, that's, that, you know, that's cool. My guardian angel, and I went to... <laughs> he said, no, it, it, it doesn't work that way uh, uh, up here. And he says, listen, let me take just a few minutes to, to kind of tell you what heaven is, is like so that you don't make an idiot of yourself, okay? He says, first of all, Daniel, you need to understand in heaven... Time is different. Time is elastic in heaven. The, the things that you're accustomed to down on the earth that would take, you know, five years, you know what, that's not even, it's not even the snap of your finger up in, in heaven. He, he says, time is different. He said, eyesight is also different. He says, you know, up here, what you can do is you can adjust your eyes and you can, you can see things that are, 30 miles away as if they're they're right in front of you and that was going to come in handy in just a, a few minutes and, and then he said something else that's different up here is is communication he said now down on the earth you guys you, you've got that verbal communication that you guys do and we do that up in heaven obviously we're doing that now but but we also have the ability to communicate just through our our, our thoughts and I'm like say what you just you just think it he goes, yeah, give it a whirl. And so I'm, I'm thinking it, and, and he's thinking back. And, and we're just doing this, this thing. 
up there, and I'm like, wow, that is, that is so cool. So I, I said, okay, I, I got it. Communication's different, eyesight's different, time's different. W what else? He says, well, I, I need to tell you about the judgment. And, oh, guys, all of a sudden, I w from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, I was just struck with this unbelievable terror that went through me. And I said, judgment? What, what, do, you, man, what do you mean? I, you know, I, 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 came, I came to that, you know, the, the, the four-year-old with the, where the book of life thing was. I mean, what, what do you mean about a, a judgment? He goes, no, 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 no. Not that kind of judgment. This isn't a, a, a judgment about, you know, whether you're going to heaven or not. You're here, man, so chill. <laughs> what this, this judgment is... This judgment is, is, is different. And I said, well, what, what do you mean? He says, well, what this is, is the time when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to spend his time with his bride. And in just a few moments, you're going to have that moment where you are going to be able to spend with your Savior, your one husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, I, I began to notice that people from all over heaven were beginning to make their, their way somewhere in, in, in the distance. And he, he said, Daniel, let, let's, let's go. Let, let, me, let me take you. And we started moving to this, and, and I could see it in the distance. I, I, I focused my eyes, and, and I could see that there was this huge stadium it was up ahead. I don't know if you've ever been in a plane going over a metropolitan city and, and you look down and you, you see that stadium. It was, it was kind of like that, but this was unlike any stadium that you had ever seen. I mean, this stadium itself was as big as a metropolitan city. I mean, it was miles and miles and miles long and miles and miles and miles wide. And we, we were all making our way to that place and we came to the to the tunnel and I began to enter in and I began to say something to Muriel and I turned around and, and he wasn't there. I said, hey, Muriel, come on, man. We, we got to go in. And he says, no, no, no. You don't get it. This is just for the bride of Christ. The angels will be hovering above. But this is just the time that you're going to spend w with him. And so I be began to make my way in. And as I came into that Stadium. Oh my goodness, y'all. It was just incredible. Here were millions and billions of people. And I stood in awe at the immensity of the body of Christ. And as I began to focus my eyes, I began to see faces of people that I forgot that I had even missed. And it was such a such an incredible feeling. I began to look around for for where I would I would sit, and and, and I saw a place where there was an empty seat, and I, I began to make my way over to that place, and and I came in, and I I, I I sat down, and when I sat down, the man next to me said, "Who are you, and when and where are you from?" And I thought to myself, okay, now, I've, I've heard of who are you and where are you from, but when are you from? And I began to understand that this was an assembly of people from the entire church age, and we were all there together. And I said, uh, my name is, is Daniel James Mathewson, and I'm from the United States of America, and I was alive on the earth when the Lord Jesus Christ sounded the trumpet. And he said, oh my goodness, that must have been incredible for you. And I was like, oh my goodness, it was. And so I thought I'd return the favor. I said, who are you and when and where are you from? And he says, my name is Injura Nagasaka. I'm thinking, well, I didn't think they spoke in tongues up here. <laughs> Come back with one more time there. Injura 
Nagasaka. He said, I, I'm from Japan in what was the, the 17th century. And I said, 17th century? I didn't even realize that there were Christians in Japan in the 17th century. He said, oh, oh, oh yeah. He said, when the, the, the wooden ships from Europe were, were, were coming to my country, not only did they bring traders, but they also brought missionaries. And there was a missionary that came into our village, and they began to share with us how the one true God had visited this planet in the person of Jesus Christ, and how he took our sin upon him and died our death so that we might be able to have a relationship with God. And once I heard that message, God began to work in my heart. I believed that he was the one true God, and I called upon him as my Savior, along with other people in our village. But the way that it went is, though there were some of the, some of the, the owners that came to Christ in our village, some of the owners didn't. My, my master didn't receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they heard about how Jesus Christ had died on the cross for us. And so what they did is they took us and they put up crosses along the side of the road and they placed us upon those crosses. I don't know I'm telling you, man. As he's telling me his story, I'm, I'm freaking out of my mind. I said, Angel, you mean you died as a martyr? Yeah. And I, and I, I, I just stared down at the ground. And he looked at me and he said, Daniel, what are you thinking? And I said, you know, I, I, I never suffered like that. I, I never went through anything like that. And he, he said, hey, that, that, that's okay. It's all in the plan of, of God. And if, if you didn't have to suffer like that, that's no problem. And, and it, it, it wasn't like I was ashamed. You know what? It was weird, man. It was like I was jealous. Because it was like he was able to enter into an, an arena of fellowship with Christ. And I began to understand the fellowship of his suffering that Paul talked about and being made conformable to his death. And I thought to myself, oh, the difference one day makes. Because you see, down on the earth, I was not at all interested in that whole suffering thing. In fact, you know what? I did everything within my power to make sure that I didn't have any persecution from anyone. You know, I, I wanted people to think that, you know, you, you could be a Christian and yet you could be cool too. And, and here I was, seeing things so differently. And all of a sudden, as we're having this conversation, this huge angel walks to the front of the platform, and the platform area was just this incredible... Uh, you knew that something major was going to be taking place from this place. And this huge angel comes to the, the center of the platform, and he had this incredible scepter in his hand. And he pounded it on that platform seven times. Four, five, six, seven. And he said, sons and daughters of God from the church age, I now present to you your Savior, your King, the Lamb of God, the Lord of glory, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And all of a sudden, all of heaven began to just clap and just rejoice as the Lord Jesus Christ made his way into the room. Oh, guys, 
wish I could tell you what that was all about. To see him for the first time face to face. And he came to his throne. And when he stood before the throne, everybody in that entire state fell on that face. And we found that the most comfortable position to be in before the risen and glorified Lord Jesus Christ was on our face. We laid there, I don't know how long, but what was coming out of me was the most incredible, euphoric feeling I had ever felt in my life was worship. As we all lay prostrate, before our Savior. And he said, Welcome home, my beloved, my precious ones. He said, All rise. And we stood to our feet. And he said, And now, I would like to present to you my father and your father. Oh my goodness, y'all. I don't know how to describe what this was. I, you know, I, I began to understand why John had such a hard time making himself clear in the book of Revelation. Because how in the world do you do you put this into, into words from the far side of that incredible stadium? Enter this, this cube. And as it was making its way in, and I focused my eyes, I saw that on each of the four corners of the cube there was these strange winged creatures, and I understood those were the four beasts, the seraphim, around God. And as I, I, I looked at it, there was this incredible light that just exuded from that, that cube, and, and the colors that were in there, they, they were outside of our spectrum. And you could see in, and there were moving parts, and inside of the moving parts were other moving parts. And, Oh my goodness, when he came into the center of the arena, here it was once again. Bam! And we could hear as we fell to our faces the seraphim crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, holy. And all of a sudden, there was music that we began to hear. Music that was coming from the throne. And all at once, we stood to our feet. And I invite you to do that right now. We stood to our feet to worship our Father, the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. We were filled with such wonder, such awe that it could be that one so holy and so great would die for us. I, I don't know how long we sang, but I do know that as we were singing, my my thoughts went back to all of those Sundays when we used to come into our church. And we would stand and we would sing. I understood with what was going on at the throne of God on this day that I didn't get it down there. And I thought to myself, If I could just go back 
if I could just go back, it would be so, so different. Would you be seated? Jesus asked us to take our, our seats. We were all wiping our tears. And, and Jesus rose from his throne. And he said, my sons and my daughters, it's now time for the, the judgment to begin. And I'd like to explain to you what is about to take place. He said, every one of you are going to be evaluated before me, before all. And the criteria by which you will be judged, first of all, you'll be judged on the quality of your life. All of you were dead in trespasses and sins, the Lord said. He said, the light of the glorious gospel shined unto you. You opened your heart and you received me and I put my life by my spirit inside of you. And you'll be judged today with what you did with that life. You will remember that I told you very clearly that you were to lay up for yourselves treasures here. And you understand now, moth and rust do not corrupt them here and thieves cannot break through and steal. I told you very clearly that now that you have been risen with me to seek the things which are above, all of the things that you now see here. I seated you here spiritually gave you spiritual eyes to be able to see into that eternal realm. And today, you'll be judged on the quality of your life. But something else, you'll also be judged on your stewardship. What you did with what I gave you. All of you have been given something different. Some of you I gave very meager means. And you will today be judged accordingly. Others of you were, were highly gifted. I gave you many, many opportunities. And you remember what I told you. It is required of a steward that a man be found faithful. And you'll understand the stewardship and the faithfulness that I was looking for. Something else in this judgment, you'll also be judged according to motive. Because you see, on the earth there were a lot of things, as you well know, that looked like they were spiritual, but were done because of a selfish motive, and today that too will be revealed. And you'll recall that in my word, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that I told you that through the stewardship of your life, and the quality of your life, and the work of your life, that what you were actually doing is that you are building a building upon the foundation of me. And if you look here, this is representative of the foundation of myself. And oh, guys, that was what made that platform so incredible. Because it was the... I don't even have the words to describe it. It was like every jewel that you could possibly imagine. And this was the foundation. That through the work of our life, we were building that, that building. And he said, you'll also remember that I told you that I was a consuming fire. And as you come before me today, what you built through your life will be placed on the foundation of me. And as we begin to walk through your life, as my eyes begin to see that, it will burn away anything that is wood, hay, and stubble. What is gold, silver, and precious stone will be refined. And based on what is left after the fire, you'll be rewarded. And yet there's something else that you need to understand about the rewards you'll receive today. First of all, there will be verbal 
commendation that some of you are going to receive. Some of you will hear from my lips today, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Others of you will receive crowns. Some of the crowns that you can receive are the crown of righteousness. And it will go to all of you who were so in love with me and so long for me to receive the glory that was due my name, that you longed for my coming and my kingdom. You see, because after the judgment is finished, what we will do is together we will mount white horses and heaven will open and we'll descend back to the earth that I just raptured you from. And I will come back and sit on my throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign for a thousand years as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And all of the earth will worship me for a thousand years. And all of you who have lived in anticipation for that day, you'll receive a crown of righteousness today. Others of you will receive a crown of life. There are millions and millions of you that loved me so much that you laid your life down and you died as a martyr. And if you did that for my glory today, you'll receive a crown of life. And others of you that lived during times of great temptation and you laid your life down and you died to yourself, you too will be rewarded with a crown of life. Others of you will receive a crown of glory. The crown of glory is for those who shepherded my flock. And now listen, that's not just for all of the pastors in the room, but for all of the pastors in the room, do understand that you will have a stricter judgment because of all of the resources that you had. One resource that you had that was different than most is the resource of time. The time that you could invest in my word and to people. And there'll be a stricter judgment for you, but you remember that I told you to make disciples, to invest your life and the life of my word into people. And for all of you that were obedient to my commission, and you took my word and invested it in people, you too will receive a crown of glory today. The moment you called upon my name, I clothed you with my righteousness. And what all of you are wearing today is represented in that robe. And yet when you come here, based on your righteousness, do you remember what I told you in Revelation 19? That you were preparing your wedding garments. Today is our wedding day. And today you will be clothed with your wedding garment. And then he said, it's time for the judgment to begin. And one by one, you'll all be called to stand before me. <laughs> and oh my, you could cut the tension with a knife. Because everybody was thinking the same thing. And all of a sudden, the angel came to the platform, and he pounded with his scepter three times. Thump, thump, thump. Timulus Germanicus. And all of a sudden, Timulus made his way out of the arena and was brought right face to face at the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness. As I focused my eyes on what was taking place, it was it was the most incredible thing I ever seen. As the Lord Jesus Christ, with his eyes of love, looked into the eyes of Timothus, Germanicus. And the look that came out of his eyes was an incredible thing. And and they, they they had a conversation that 
I couldn't hear. But all of a sudden, his building was revealed on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ behind him. And oh my goodness, it, it looked like uh, it looked like New York City. This incredible building. And, and as the building came up, there was something weird that came up in, in our minds. We we had like a biographical sketch that came into our minds that allowed us to understand who this guy was and what his life was all about. And, and, and in the biographical sketch, we understood that he was a, a, a Christian in the, the third century during that time of persecution from the Roman Empire. And he professed the Lord Jesus Christ, and though he did, didn't have a lot of money and didn't have a lot of means, he fell in love with Jesus Christ and did all that he could to help the poor and and to share the gospel with people. And because of his testimony for Christ, he was arrested, and they took him, and they placed him on the rack, and we were able to see that. Maybe some of you don't understand the rack. It was this apparatus where they, 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 they tied him to it and began to just stretch him. And as they were stretching him, they began to scrape his body and were just skinning, skinning him alive. And we heard Timulus as he cried out, and he said, Oh, God. I am yours. And as he was a bloody mess, they took him and they threw him to the lions and to the leopards and they consumed his body. And we watched as the Lord Jesus Christ placed his hands on his shoulders and he said, Timorous, this is my boy. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And he was immediately... The, the robe that he was clothed with, it was just so incredible, man. I had never seen anything like it. He, he was, he was the, the brightest thing in the room other than the Lord himself, man. He was shining like the North Star against the black of night, man. It was just incredible. He went back to his seat. And, and I, I saw this process re re repeated over and, and over and over. And I, I, I don't know, maybe there were millions of people, but again, began to notice some trends that were taking place. First of all, I noticed that not everybody received the verbal commendation, well done, my good and faithful servant, and, and you, I am well pleased. And I began to notice as all of this was taking place that not all of the robes were the same, that there were some that were much more glorious and much more radiant than others. And I, I began to, to, to understand the whole thing of what is of eternal significance. And, and boy, my mind just went back to all of the times when I lived for the moment, when I lived for the temporal. And all of a sudden, the angel came to the platform again and said, Pamponia! And Pamponia came before the Lord and was placed there, and, and her building was placed there, and the biographical sketch filled into our minds, and we understood that she was a believer in the first century. Around 50 A.D., she came to know the Lord Jesus Christ in Rome, long before Paul had ever gotten there. She was one of the first, if not the first, of the senatorial class, to, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of her faith, she was ostracized and, and she began to be persecuted, even by her own husband. And yet she put on the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, just like God had said. And she was able to win her husband to the Lord Jesus Christ to her life. A church was established in their home, a church that lasted for three solid years centuries and the Lord Jesus Christ took his hands and he says this is my daughter well done my good and faithful servant in you 
I am well pleased. And all of a sudden, she had this glorious robe and she made her way back to her seat. And then the angel came out again. William Carey! I had heard that name before. William Carey came before his Savior and he knelt before him and they had that conversation that we couldn't hear. And if there was ever somebody that was an unlikely hero in the Christian world, it was William Carey, a shoemaker by trade in England. He went to Malta as a missionary and from there went on to India and God used him in an incredible way through the mission work there in India. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this incredible building that we were seeing, the biographical sketch that was filling in our minds, the Lord Jesus Christ did something awesome. He says, if you are here today because of the ministry of William Carey, and you see everybody understood exactly the connections of why they were actually there. If you're here today because of William Carey, please stand to your feet. Oh my goodness. Everywhere I looked, there were people that stood to their feet. It was incredible to see how he was rewarded. The angel came again and cried, Angela Moser! And Angela made her way down to the front. Angela, as the biographical sketch filled in, Angela was from a western country. She was a public school teacher. She remained single because she had a sick sister and a, and a sick mother. And she served faithfully in her local church, behind the scenes, was never really did anything too dramatic, just faithfully made disciples. <laughs> but when they called Angela's name, I could see there was movement up with Muriel and the, and the angels. And, and I, I, I thought, to Muriel, I said, is she something special? Muriel said, oh my goodness, is she something special? And I'm like, well, what did she do? What did she make? What did she build? He said, ah, none of that stuff that you think is important on the earth. He, he said, we have a saying up here with the angels. When Angela prays, 10,000 demons quake in their shoes. What makes Angela so incredible was her prayer life. As I saw that, I thought back to my prayer life. And I thought to myself, oh man, if I could go back and do that different. I, I, it, the difference one day makes. The way you see things from here is just so different. Angel came. Joseph Ray Robinson. And Joseph was before the, the throne and saw his building the biographical sketch. And we began to understand some things about this, this Joseph that he, he grew up during the Depression. And because of his race, he didn't have the the opportunity that some other people had to be educated and to read, but his mama would take her Bible at night and would teach him the Word of God and he began to memorize the Word of God and he had, had thousands of verses that he had committed to memory. And, and because he never had the education, well, he, he shined shoes and he drove limos and he, he worked as a, a security guard in, a, in an office... And I began to understand about Joseph's life. And Jesus said, if you're here today because of Joseph, would you stand to your feet? And I saw at least a hundred people from that office building that were in that room because of that, that security guard. And I thought to myself, this morning, I didn't have time for that guy. And now I'm not worthy to shine his shoes. 
the angel came. Juanita Perez, my cleaning lady. I began to understand about Juanita. She was from the Philippines and married an American soldier, brought her to the United States of America. They had four kids and he left her. She came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and worked several jobs doing everything that she could to provide a living for those kids and all the while building into them the Lord Jesus Christ. She shared Christ with them and won them to Christ and I began to see the prayers that she offered for my kids. I saw the difference her prayers made in my kids. And I understood at that moment prayed more for my kids than I had. The angel came. Thump! 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 Daniel James Matthewson. And immediately I came before the Lord. John was talking about when he said I fell at his feet as dead because I was afraid to move and he entered into a conversation with me and I began to understand this was the conversation that he was having with everybody else and he said Daniel let, let me explain th this judgment first of all understand the purpose the purpose of this Daniel is not to punish you this is a matter of stewardship. What we're going to be doing here, Daniel, is we're going to be evaluating what you did with what I gave you. I gave you 45 years. 30 of those years you lived after you received me. And what we're going to do in this judgment is we're going to evaluate now what you did that was of eternal significance and then he said and I want you to understand this Daniel understand the timing of this you, you see this judgment is coming at the end of time because sometimes the, the, a, a person's life is not fully understood and the impact of that is not fully realized for some time to come and I had understood that because of what we had just seen just a few minutes ago with William Carey and, and then he said and I want you to understand the process and he, he said I, I want you to understand this whole thing about the building and he worked me through what was going to take place as the building of my life was there and he says what we're going to what we're going to do Daniel is we're going to walk through your life and, and you remember I, I told you that time is elastic in heaven you see when all these other people came up it was just like it was just like that but you know what was getting ready to happen we were getting ready to walk through my entire life but I was getting ready to see it this time not from my vantage point but from his and he explained what was going to take place as he began to walk through my life in the building and what would be left would be the reward that I would I would receive after the fire and he says Daniel are you ready Lord, I'm, I'm ready. And I, I, I've heard people say, you know, my life passed before me. Well, my life literally passed before me. And we began to work through all, all 45 years. I began to see my entire life. And I, I saw the first 15 years of my life. And what I was just consumed with as I looked at that was sin and, and self and how Satan had so dominated my life and everything that I, I saw there was just totally incinerated. And I, I, I saw that, that sinfulness like I had never seen it before and I was so embarrassed looking at it as I was seeing it and yet as I looked at the Lord Jesus Christ, I, His face didn't change. And 
I began to understand. He's not seeing it. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But the most joyful moment in those 15 years was that moment as a 15-year-old teenager when I was in that church service and I could see it. I, I could see inside of me. I could see that dead spirit inside of me. And I watched as that sinful young man from the last row of the balcony made his way down and came down and fell on his face. And I saw what took place when I called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could see the light move right into that dead spirit. I was just so overwhelmed with praise. And when I looked at the Lord Jesus Christ, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, Daniel, now that you've come to this place, you're saved. Now you do have the ability to do things in the eternal realm. And now we can get serious with this. Now, guys, I obviously don't have 30 years to walk you through everything but let me just summarize some things for you as the Lord Jesus Christ began to walk me through my life th there were some observations that I began to make number one the first observation I make made was Jesus opinion of me is more important than people's opinion of me He's more, his opinion of me is more important than everyone else's combined. And, and I began to notice as I was walking through my life, I began to notice a, 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 a pattern. I began to notice that for some reason I had this, this strong desire in, in me to, to be noticed and to be accepted by people, to, to be somebody. I noticed that people's opinion of me as I lived my life on the earth, people's opinion of me meant more to me than Jesus' opinion of me. And I saw it as I was a little kid, man. He walked me through when I was in elementary school. I was in sixth grade. And I was out on the playground with my little friend Jimmy. And, and you know, we were just in that middle school age, you know, not quite a a cool guy and yet not a little kid anymore. And we, we were just hanging out on the monkey bars and... Some of the cool kids in the middle school came over and, and said, Hey, Daniel, we need another guy to play in the game. You want to play? And I said, Hey, yeah, sure, we'd love to come. And, he, and they said, No, no, no. We just have room for one. Jimmy can't come. And I looked at Jimmy, and he looked at me, and he said, Oh, hey, that's cool. Go ahead. And I said, Really? He said, Yeah, it doesn't matter. And, and so I went off with the cool guys. And I saw what I did to my little friend Jimmy from the judgment seat of Christ. But I was in the cool crowd now. And I saw it all through the, my, my junior high years and how important it was. People's opinion of me. And I said, Lord, why, why was it that that meant so much to me? And he said, Daniel, I told you that I am the bread of life. And unless you feast on me, you're going to hunger for other relationships. The reason that you hungered to be noticed and to be somebody is because you never really feasted on me. Moved into the college years, and I, I, my best friend Jerry, we, 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 we hung out, we did everything together, man. We had all of that, you know, the handshake thing that we did together and, you know, all of that, that crazy stuff. And, man, we just vowed that we were going to we were going to be partners for life. We were going to get married. We were going to live next door to each other. We were going to, you know, do that, that whole thing. And then it came time for the flat houses to, to pledge. We were sitting in the dorm one, one evening, and all of a sudden, the cool fraternity walks in, and they said, Hey, Daniel, we want you to be one of us. And I said, Awesome, man, we'd love to. And they said, No, 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 no. We're not here for Jerry. We're just here for you, Daniel. And I looked at my friend Jerry, and here went again. He looked at me and said, "Oh, that's cool. Hey, go for it, man. This is man. This is a great opportunity." I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah, man. Go for it." And so I got into the, the cool fight house. You see, Jerry wasn't the athletic type. 
And so they, they, didn't, they didn't want him. And all of a sudden, from the judgment seat, I saw what I did to Jerry. Second observation I made as he was walking me through my life is worthwhile is much more important than worthless. Worthwhile is much more important than worthless. I, I, I saw from heaven's vantage point the impact that a person can have for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when I lived on the earth, people were, they were just like scenery, you know? They were there to kind of make my life look good. And that's the way that I lived my life. But man, from heaven's vantage point and from the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, I saw it so differently. And I, I said to the Lord, Lord, did I do anything that was worthwhile? And he brought to my mind Sandy. You see, not long after... Not long after I got, I got saved, there was this young teenage girl that began to came, come into the youth group, and it was obvious that she wasn't quite fitting in, and, and, and so prompted by the Spirit of God, I, I went over to Sandy and began to spend some, some time with her, and had the, the glorious opportunity to be able to win Sandy to Christ. I said, Lord, whatever happened to Sandy? He said, hey. Daniel, she can't wait for your judgment to be over because she wants to thank you. I said, really? He said, yeah. Sandy, after, after high school, she went to her, to her college and, and she set up a, an evangelistic Bible study at her college. She, she met a, a, a Christian guy through that and, and they married and they had three kids and they faithfully served the Lord and they won people to Christ. And her three kids have all come to Christ, and they've won people to Christ. And Daniel, you're going to receive a reward for all of it. And I began to, to understand that I made an impact in Sandy, who impacted other people. But I was getting partial credit for the people that they, she had, they had won. And then the, those people had won people to Christ. And I was getting partial credit for that. And I was, I was just blown away at the impact that a high school kid could have for Christ. And I said, I didn't have too many of those, though, did I, Lord? And he said, no, Daniel, you didn't. And he reminded me of, he reminded me of Peggy. You, you see, when I got into, the, got into the, the cool frat house, they started leading me in a direction that I, I really didn't want to go. I, I started drinking and... And even though I was a believer in Christ, I had gotten sexually active and I saw that from the judgment seat of Christ. And oh my goodness, I saw it so differently. And, and I, I met this girl, Peggy, and she, she wasn't like the other frat house girls. She, she was different. She was, she was wholesome. She didn't drink. She wasn't sexually active, but it didn't take me long to start moving her down the wrong path and we ended up breaking up and it was a big nasty breakup and I said Lord what, whatever happened to, to, to Peggy he said well she went through three husbands and now she's on the earth in the tribulation period and Daniel she's already taken the mark of the beast and she will spend forever in hell. Oh my goodness. I thought, what in the world was I thinking? And I, I just began to understand the things from the judgment seat Things just look, things just look different. From that point, the rest of my life just, just sped by. There was nothing. It was worthless. I'd taken the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that he had given to me, and I had squandered it. And he says, okay, Daniel, the judgment 
is now complete. Let me summarize for you. He said, Daniel, I gave you financial resources like most people could never imagine. You might be interested to know, Daniel, that of all of the people that ever lived, you were in the top 1%. And yet, you gave less than people who were in the bottom 1%. Daniel, I, I gave you human resources that were unbelievable. I gave you Christian parents. I gave you a, a good church where people were willing to make you a disciple. I gave you pastors that taught you the Word of God. And yet you lived your life for yourself. Daniel, the summarization of your life is the worthlessness of your life far outweighed the worthwhileness. <laughs> and I just collapsed before it. And I thought, what could be worse than that? And then I found out. He said, Daniel, you left your first love. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried. And I saw it so differently. I thought if I could just go back and live it again, I wouldn't live my life for myself anymore. I wouldn't leave him who did so much for me. And I thought, man, I didn't think there were going to be tears in heaven. And then I remembered that passage where it said that the Lord would wipe away all tears, presuming that there are tears to wipe away. And I said, well, here they are. And as I laid down, crying, the Lord lifted up my face and said, but Daniel, though you left your first love, your first love never left you. And he says, there is now, therefore, in Christ, no condemnation. And I thought, he's not going to condemn me. And he laid his hands on me, and he raised me up, and he says, welcome, Daniel Matthewson. My robe was not like the other people I had seen. I didn't receive the verbal commendation, and yet, you know what? Everybody in that room <laughs> cheered for me, for Daniel Madison. And then all of a sudden, from one part of the, the arena, a guy came with the crowns that the Lord Jesus Christ had given to him. And he came right up to the throne. And he cast that crown at his feet. And as he began to do that, other people that had those crowns began to come and cast them at his feet. And I understood that it was the most supreme act of worship. And I thought to myself, oh, I wish I had a crown to be able to offer at his feet. And all of a sudden, once again, we could hear music that began to come as one by one all over the building. People came with what the Lord Jesus Christ had given to them and rewarded them with. And as an act of worship, they came and brought him to his feet. Let's stand together as we crown him.
such an awesome thing to behold as the body of Christ came and brought their reward before the King of Kings. The only one worthy and were able to cast it at His feet. You can be seated. And the Lord said, the judgment is now complete. And He said, now I want you to be able to spend time with those that you love. And He dismissed us all at once to be able to go to those to our loved ones and oh my goodness man all at once all over this room as just like the, the most incredible fireworks display that you can imagine people were just dispersed to 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 a place that they just kind of inherently knew to go and and there was my family man Oh my goodness, I came and I just embraced my wife and my kids and there were my parents, they had died years before and, and, and here were my loved ones and we were all there and it was just the most incredible time. And then all of a sudden, I heard this, this sound, it, it, was, it was different than than anything that I had heard in heaven before. It was, it was a weird sound, an annoying sound. Ah! Oh, it was a dream! hit that snooze button <laughs> and I sat on the edge of the bed and thought it was a dream oh, I want to go back <laughs> and I thought you know what all the way through that I, I was thinking if I could just go back just go back, I'd do it differently. And sitting on the edge of that bed, I, I looked over at my wife as she was still laying there sleeping. And I thought to myself, you know what, hon? Life's going to be different for you from now on. I'm going to love you the way that Christ loved the church. Gave himself for it. I got up. I left my bedroom and I went in to my kids and I thought about Juanita. And I stood at the doorway and looked at my kids and began praying for my kids. And thought, life's going to be different for you too. And I thought to myself, I've got the chance now. I've got a chance to be able to do life differently. And you know what the whole purpose of this is tonight, y'all? It, it, it's just a meager attempt to get us to see what it might be like and what we might feel on that day so that we might be able to leave this room tonight and say, I want to do it different. Yeah. And I want to ask you to, to do something. If, if God has spoken to your heart tonight, I do want to ask you tonight to spend some time talking to Him about your life. And about how you want it to be different from this night forward. And here's what I'd like to ask you to do. If you're physically able, I'd like to ask you to just right there where you're seated, to just, if you're physically able, if you're not, fine, just stay right where you are. But if you're physically able, I'd like to ask you to just turn around 
and get on your knees before God right there in that pew and let's all make this an altar. Let's make it a let's make it the throne room of God, y'all. And let's come into the presence of our King. And let's surrender our lives to to Him. And would you from your heart just say, Oh God, from this night forward, I want to ask you to help me to see beyond the temporal things that I see every single day. I want to see into that eternal realm. I want to live for what is important. Your opinion, Lord, means more to me than anything. Worthwhile is all that matters to me. I want to see my life the way that I'll see it one day as you walk me through it at the judgment seat. Oh, God, help me. And why don't you spend that time with your Savior right now?